Hello and welcome to the Yoga Life Podcast with me, Kevin Boyle. Today I'm with Brian Keane of Brian Keane Fitness. Brian is a best-selling author. He is a podcaster extraordinaire and a Instagram phenomenon. He's also one of the nicest and most enthusiastic people you could possibly hope to meet. So without further ado, let's speak to Brian. How's it going, Brian? It's going amazing. Thanks so much for having me on. <laughs> Well, thank you for for joining me. A um, bit of a surreal moment for me. I, the last time I seen you was at was at Wellfest, actually. How how was that for you? Yeah, it was so much fun. <laughs> um, loved it. I was with uh, Super Value on the Super Value stage, so I was speaking briefly, um, and then I had a workout on some other stage. I'm not sure which one that was, but uh, mm. it was amazing. It was the best day. Like I'd never been, um, and I saw you because I'm like, oh, I was like, well done on the podcast, <laughs> like um, because I had seen it. I had seen it around the spot on mine on iTunes, and like, good man. I was like, that's the way to do it, Kev. <laughs> I know, man. I, I, to be honest, I was. It was. A, it was meant a lot to me that you recognised me because it's funny. The first the, I only met you once before, and um, I came up and did the old fanboy thing of asking for the photograph, you know. And I was a bit like, uh, because because the thing is, I about a year ago. So I, I should probably say. Um, before I started teaching yoga, I was a personal trainer for a very brief time, and I remember thinking to myself, "Is there any other way you? Any other way you can?" make money essentially apart from just teaching classes so that's how i found your podcast and i found your your videos on instagram uh, not instagram sorry on youtube and then that's when i, I begin to research what you what you'd done so that's how it all started uh, and i'd started my own youtube channel and you know with youtube it's a massive production it really like you have to put a lot of effort in and i think whenever you start something like that that requires a lot of effort you need someone who has led the way has shown you oh it can be done and it's not just in the american market it can be done in the irish market so then when i seen you at the it was i think it was the, it was the rugby event the hot yoga hot pod yoga event um yeah i got i got the picture so that's when we first met so um um i i should say actually as you know this is a yoga based podcast but there's the, there's a thing in, in within the yoga industry where people feel uncomfortable talking about business about how to make money from teaching yoga but my approach is I, i've met so many people that want to teach yoga for a living some of them are working part-time and, and they're teaching the odd class here and there and they want to work full-time as a yoga teacher but they think they can't make a living from it make a career from it and what, the reason why i wanted to speak to you so much is because you've shown how to do that it's not yoga but fitness and, and yoga have very um uh very common areas essentially the same mindset that you apply to yoga can be applied to fitness and i want to speak to you to see essentially pick your brains as to how you, you know, uh, wrote a best-selling book how you built such a massive podcast and how your experience has been in the irish market so there's a lot to go through um i'll start with well firstly with the the book because um i was looking at the the uh, like my, my main question is how do you write a book <laughs> and how do, uh, like because it was published this time last year last summer right yeah 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 and 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 it's already it's got 400 and you know i've done my research correctly it's got 418 five eight point eighteen amazon reviews with an average rating of five stars so um and it was bestseller for something like eight weeks or something like that was it how many yeah weeks it yeah it was crazy um <laughs> well just to kind of take you through the timeline of it i suppose yeah the writing the book was very similar to how you do anything and i have a big philosophy on my podcast that how you do anything is how you do everything and mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's fitness or yoga or sport or business in general the things that make you quote unquote successful whatever subjective success looks like for you it's very important to to find those success metrics for you yeah for me it was to write a best-selling book for me it was to write a book that had impact i wanted to write a book that would help um mm -hmm. that was literally the goal from day one and i didn't care if it sold you know a thousand copies or twenty thousand copies which is up and around the market was in you know the, the turn of the year and mm. i wanted to write a book that one was filling a gap where i felt there was no book that covered the angle that i covered mm -hmm. and two i wanted to write a perennial seller so one that 
made more sense and helped people more five years from the day it was written. I didn't want to write a book that would, which happens in a lot of fitness circles, where you write a book that is a bestseller for the first, you know, two months that it's out, three months that it's out, and then it gets dated and everybody buys it and then it's, it disappears off the shelf a couple of years later. I, d I didn't want to write a book like that. I wanted to write one that was more relevant in five years time than it was the day it was released. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that it's been so successful is that it's continually selling like every month and every week there's people buying it and tagging me and the reviews are climbing up continuously. I was so fortunate, Kev, because it was one of those cases that I didn't, you don't know when you write a book, you don't know how it's going to go. And yeah. it's, it's a difficult, it's a very, very difficult avenue to take. I'm working with people now in mentorship programs and helping them with their business. And I've got one guy who's writing a book right now and he's tearing his hair out. And I'm telling him, mate, that's the process. I was like, <laughs> there's, there's days you sit down and write and you're like, what am I talking about? I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and then there's other days where it's as if somebody else took over your body and you're like, I can't believe I wrote this. And mm. that's what the process of writing a book is like. And it alternates because you can't tell what day that's going to come up. There's a really good book by Stephen King, the horror author, called mm -hmm. On Writing. And that book is incredible for anyone that wants to write a book for the process of what he does. Like he says he just sits down every morning in the same place, in the same chair, with the same cup of coffee. It was a cigarette for him as well. And he would wait for the days that the muse showed up. But he wrote regardless of whether he felt like it. And that comes back to the how you do anything is how you do everything. The people that are in great shape from yoga and have the best flexibility and the most inner calm are the people that do it consistently on the days they may not even want to do it. The people yeah. in fitness are the people that train on the days you want to do it even though you don't feel like it. People that get their books written, and I'm in the process of starting my second book, which will be a follow-on from this one, and it's down to just showing up. And I sat at the computer every day for months and just wrote. And I prioritized it. I got up in the morning and did it. I've got a three-year-old at home. She was young when I started writing the book first because a lot of the mindset stuff was written because of the th place I had to put myself in when I was writing. So, for example, for those of you that aren't familiar with the book, it's called The Fitness Mindset. And mm -hmm. I came at it from a very different angle to most fitness people. I came at it and split the book into two parts, essentially. The first half of the book is all fitness. So nutrition, training, sleep, supplements, alcohol, hydration, all the stuff you need to get into amazing shape. And then the second half of the book was all mindset. So all the stuff that you need to stay in amazing shape. Because when I was working one-to-one -one as a personal trainer, and now online capacity in the last two, three years, it was the same things that were happening with people I was working with. They, were, they knew how to get in shape most for the most part, same way as people that are in yoga. Most people know that, well, I need to stretch more and I'll feel better. But people mm -hmm. don't do it. And that was the question that was irking on my mind. I'm like, people know to eat less food. They know they need to exercise more, but they're still not doing it. And that's the mm -hmm. angle I took the mindset section of the book. And I molded them together so that it was going to be a complete guide. So everything you need to get in great shape and then everything you need to stay in great shape. Creating the right habits, dealing with mm -hmm. stress, dealing with anxiety, taking control of situations, all these things that set you back because life gets in the way of fitness. And mm -hmm. I think it's very applicable to yoga as well because I, I'm the reason I love yoga is because yoga is my fitness for most people. I don't do enough of it, but I know I need to do it. <laughs> it's, I, it's, it's exactly that. It's the reason I love it so much because I need it because I need the flexibility. I need the, I love the inner calm that comes from it. But I don't prioritize yoga. I need somebody to step over me and be like, right, we're doing a yoga class now or we're doing a one-to-one -one yoga session because I won't do it myself. And mm -hmm. it gives me so much context for fitness because majority of people are like that with fitness. So it, it allows me to empathize a lot. And that's mm -hmm. effectively how the book came about. And I yeah. just wrote a book that was trying to fill a gap that mm -hmm. I, it wasn't there. The reason I wrote it was because I was trying to serve the people that followed me and I, I was lucky, like I, I was blown away, Kev, by the international success of the book. That surprised me. Yeah. Um, like it did so well in Ireland, it did so well in the UK, but it also did really well in the States. And we'd very, very, there was very little publicity in the States. It was word of mouth and referrals. 
Mm. And that surprised me. And I remember the day the book came out, I w- like this blew my mind. And I, I was lucky. I I built a platform. Podcast was doing well. Social media, I had good numbers. But the day the book came out, it hit. I got, an, I got a message from Amazon about 12 hours after it was released. And they're like, right, you've hit the bestseller list. And I was like, oh, my God. Wow, and then I clicked cool. in. It was in, 40, <laughs> it was in number 47 on Amazon. It was right behind Harry Potter. I was like, oh, no my way. God. And it, and it stayed there <laughs> for, for, it was like eight weeks straight. And then it dropped off for two weeks. And then it went back on again. Um, wow. it, it was incredible. So that would be yeah. my advice. I, I think what a book does, you have to understand, and I, I'm doing this with a couple of my mentor people at the minute, you have to ask, why are you writing the book? What is the need for it? Because you can write a book for lead generation for your business, where you bring people into your ecosystem, where you write a book on, you know, this is how you perform these certain yoga movements, and it gives you a beginner entry with the mm-hmm. potential upsell to working with you directly. That's one way of writing a book. You may write a book to become authority so that you can go around and speak at Wellfest or speak at different um, seminars around the world or around Ireland or the UK. Mm-hmm. That's another reason you write a book to become an authority or you write a book in my case was just to, for it was impact. I wanted to have impact and give myself a little bit more authority in the space. Once you know why you're writing it, you're going to write a very, very different book. So it's very, very important to know the reason up front because otherwise you're just putting words on a piece of paper without any end goal. And it's very mm-hmm. hard to stay on top of that because it doesn't have any reason. So once you know why you're writing it and what the purpose of that book is, it makes it way easier to write. And also that one piece of advice I'd offer, and sorry, Kev, I'm really bad at going off on tangents. No, it's good, is, man. Keep going. Is, is write to one person. The hmm. biggest mistake people make that I've experienced is when you try and please everybody, you end up pleasing nobody. So when I hmm. write, I write to one person. The whole first half of the book, I was writing to my 19-year-old self, who, and I started lifting weights at 13. I was very, very active, and, and I've, I've been weight training and fitness lifestyle and resistance training for a long time. So I had already been training for five, six years by the time I was 19 or 20, but I was still making all these mistakes with not training mm-hmm. correctly, not eating properly, following diets that I thought were going to help me that weren't in alignment with my goals. So I wrote that section of the book for that person. I wrote the second half of the book for a 22-year-old, my 22-year-old daughter, who's not 22, but I pictured that something had happened to me and all that sections with life skills and dealing with anxiety, dealing with stress, dealing with negativity, Mm. dealing with negative people. I wrote that for her in case something happened to me. So I had to go to that place to write it, but it led to a stronger book. And it's one of the reasons that's, like I get some, Kev, if I showed you some of the messages I get from people on that mindset section, like I, I've had people be like, I was in tears reading that section because I had to go to that place to write it. And mm-hmm. when you're telling the truth and you're vulnerable with people like that and you're letting your mess become your message because I came out the other side of a lot of those issues, it lands with people and it resonates with people, but it came off the back of writing to one person. I wrote to myself for the first half and I wrote to her. I had to imagine my, my daughter's three, but I had to imagine her 22, 23 struggling because something had happened to me or struggling because of life. And I wrote to her hmm. and it just made it easier. So it doesn't matter who you're writing to, but write to one person, whether it's to a younger you or to your perfect client, whoever it is, when you're writing a hmm. book, write it to a single person because that gives you strategy. I actually do that with everything, if I'm honest. When I'm making videos, when I'm creating podcasts, when I'm doing anything, I generally write it or create it for one person, my avatar, my perfect person, and then whoever Mm -hmm. else it hits, it hits. That's kind of the way I create it. It's why I'm probably able to put out as much content as I do is because I know exactly who I'm speaking to, and and that helps. So that in a nutshell is uh would be my advice if that's a plan to go down that route writing a book or writing a best-selling book or anything along those lines you see brian one thing that's undeniable about you is your enthusiasm and there's two things that i want to pick up on the first is your mind so they both um Okay, it has to do with your mindset. So the first is you believe you can do it. So you believe, okay, I'm going to write a book. I mean, who 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 says that? Like, not many people actually would say I'm going to write a book. The second thing is you. So you have that belief, but the second thing is more most importantly, there's no point having a skill or a talent unless other people know you have it. So the second part is you believe people want to hear your message. 
And what I've noticed, so they're, they're, they're the two vital components, I think, it, it, to, that have brought you uh, to where you are now, in my opinion, from an outside point of view. And when I did the yoga te- my advanced yoga teacher training, I'm there with um, with yogis that have got way more experience than me. I mean, like years and years more experience than me, way more physical, uh, uh, physically advanced, advanced physical practices than I have. Um, and then when the when the trainers went around and said, "Okay, everybody, um, how do you make money now teaching yoga?" And a couple of people were, weren't even yoga teachers. They said, "Oh, well, I just teach part time." Or um, so the options were: you can teach classes, you can do workshops, you can do events like Wellfest, for example. You can do you can write a book, you can do retreats, trainings, all this kind of stuff. And hardly anyone put their hand up to say that they'd done any of those because they were too. I don't know, they were too shy they were too um doubted themselves too much like who would care first thing is they're like well who am i to host a retreat who am i to train other teachers and who would want to hear what i have to say and i was shocked and i, I was the one that kept putting my hand up saying oh yeah i've done i'm teaching a welfare in two months or i'm i've done this event and i've done i do workshops at least at once a month and i have i have the least experience of everyone but yet i have that inside me that i think um i have something to share yeah i have a, a value to add and i really think that if a lot of people listen to this podcast that are looking to make a career from teaching yoga um they need to understand that uh, what they're good at that's the most important thing and then believe that other people want to hear that or see that because without that that's gonna it's crippling if you just think that if you don't have that mindset and you end up working in an office or doing working for someone else basically um so i think i think that's really really important and that um that brings me to your podcast because it seems like i looked at the reviews on your podcast as well like for i've done i got my stats here but <laughs> your podcast is like what four 416 itunes reviews average again five stars um i mean podcasting <laughs> podcasting someone said to me the other day who went i went to college with they said have you started a podcast and they kind of looked at me like who are you to start a podcast <laughs> like like what would why would anyone want to hear what what i have to say that's what the kind of the, the look they gave me and and um and it's because of people like you in the irish market that have uh yourself in like the happy pair for example that i look to have, have kind of shown the way in terms of podcasting and generating content so how how did that all start well, the podcast, because it kind of comes from two angles. One is, and I'm going to use this to just kind of give myself a foundation pillar to work off because I know there's a lot of people out there that have that who will listen to me thought process. They don't realize that they have something to add or value to add. And I have a big philosophy that if you, the one I use is gym, but yoga is the same. If you've only ever done one yoga class, you can help the person that's still on the cl- on the couch that needs to get up and stretch more. Yeah. You can always provide value and you can always help. The, the, the terms then are relative. Some people are going to get into the molecular level of what happens in your physiology when you do yoga. Somebody else is just getting somebody to stretch more. Like it's completely relative, but mm. equally valuable if you're serving the right market. And everybody has that at the beginning. And the advice I'll offer before I go on to the podcast mm-hmm. is everybody starts with that Uh, kev i was putting out videos and content for probably about 18 months before anybody watched and it's Mm. so disheartening like i'm very fortunate now i don't know what my platforms have but they're 70 80 thousand across most things Mm. podcasts 80 90 thousand downloads a month like the book does great you know speaking engagements all these things but for the first 12 or 18 months nobody watched nobody was commenting nobody was engaging and you want to give up because it's really, really frustrating when you think you're putting out your best work or you think you're putting out things that are valuable and it's not being received by people. Mm. And for me then, it was a little bit of understanding on the psychology of people because the reason I started the podcast and one of my favorite quotes is from Wayne Gretzky who was one of the top NHL players, the Michael Jordan of hockey. Mm -hmm. And he used to always say, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going. And that's what I try and do with people's attention. Because you can have the best message in the world. But if you don't have somebody's attention, you can't put that message in front of them. 
So yeah. I try and see where people's attention is first and foremost, and then I try and provide the content or the value up front because it's a value exchange. People are giving you their ear. If you're listening to this podcast right now, you may be passively doing something else, but they're listening to me and you. They're, that they're engaged in what we're saying. And it's a value exchange. So it's our duty as people to try and provide value up front to them in some way, shape, or form. And I know that. It's why I'm so grateful that people follow my stuff or listen to my podcast or read my blogs or read the book or whatever it is. I'm so grateful for that because you could be doing something else. And (laughs) when you know where people's attention is, you can serve them and help them. And all business is is a reframe of when you have something to offer people, this is the biggest, as I do more work with consulting and that side of my life now, when you reframe the fact that if you have a service or a product that's going to help people, it's your duty to provide that to them. I know myself, if I need a yoga, for example, I've got one of my girls, or a girl that comes to my house and does yoga with me. I'm happy to give her money because I need to do freaking yoga because I need to stretch out because I'm so tight from years and years of training. That's a value exchange. She's coming to me. I'm more than happy to give her money because I'm like, I need this. That's what business is. When you have something that's providing value to the other person and you're getting paid for that, it's just reframing that as opposed to, oh, I'm afraid to ask for money, which is what people do. And they've got this fear of asking because who am I? And Mm -hmm. That's just the wrong way to look at it. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that's just a reframe of thought and different context that you're given the situation. And just to kind of, I wanted to talk on that because people sometimes see the tip of an iceberg with, say, me or anybody. You know, again, people, success is what success means for you. If you're using it as a a vanity metric of followers and downloads and, and income, I've, I've done well. I'm very, very fortunate. But the sense that at the beginning, nobody was listening, nobody was engaging. And that's what happens when you start first. This is why you cut your learning curve by listening to podcasts like this and listening to people that have done it already because you cut your learning curve. If yeah. I was smarter and could go back, I would have read more books. I would have listened to more podcasts. I would have consumed more information or bought consultancy time or gone to more seminars where I was learning about these things. I was trying to figure it all out myself. And by all means, you have to make a certain amount of mistakes, but try and limit the amount you make yourself. Like, mm-hmm. yes, you have to learn from mistakes, but nobody said they had to be your mistakes. You can learn mm-hmm. from the mistakes of other people. And that's how you cut your learning curve. I was putting out content on, say, YouTube or Facebook, not realizing that the attention was elsewhere. You know, it was on Instagram. Mm-hmm. I should have been doing more on Instagram. And mm-hmm. then I started to realize that, well, social media is a very, very powerful thing. And I, I was lucky in the sense that, I had a very successful one-to-one personal training business. And then I built social media. Hmm. Social media was very much, and podcasts, et cetera, was was off the back of already having a successful one-to-one business. And Hmm. when I started to realize that it was all about attention, that you needed to be in front of people and then you could tell them your message. The reason I started the podcast to tie into that was Mm -hmm. I saw a bit of a land grab. I saw that the attention was starting, and I've been listening to podcasts for 12 years, Kev. I was in college listening to podcasts on websites. (laughs) So they've been out that long. It's Mm. just they haven't popped, and there was no iTunes, there was no Stitcher, there was no Spotify. Um, So I've been listening to podcasts for a long time, since I was 19, Mm. and... I saw a bit of a land grab. I started to see the attention of people and, and people, I, I freaking love people. Like the psychology of why we do what we do fascinates me. Like it literally, I could spend hours just thinking about why we do what we do and why we think what we think. And I started to see a shift in people listening to more podcasts. They were, people are busy and there was a slight shift away from video because video is hard to watch when you're in the car. Yeah. And... It's hard to watch if you're prepping your meals or if you're stretching or if you're out for a walk with the dog. Mm -hmm. It's hard to watch a video. But podcast is passive. You can do something else while you're doing it. So I Mm. jumped in on that the same way as I've just created an Alexa skill because I think that's where the next land grab is coming. Uh, I think voice is going to be unbelievably powerful. I literally just sent off my first 30 Alexa skills. They're going to wait for design. They'll be out by August. I'm not sure when this airs, but they're they're flash briefings, daily fitness flash briefings. 
Alexa's not big here yet, but Alexa's big in California. And I used to live in California, and I noticed a trend that things pop there first, then the rest of the yeah. states gets it, then London gets it, then Dublin gets it, and then the rest of Ireland gets it. We're always a couple of years behind. And I started to see a trend with Alexa and some of the inbuilt functions where they're building Alexa and Amazon are taking over the world. For those unfamiliar with Alexa, it's the a voice activated assistant. It's it's basically like Siri on your phone, but activated in your house. It does everything. You can go onto Alexa and be like, Alexa, order me um, the next season of Game of Thrones when it comes out on DVD, and it'll do that. You can go, Alexa, play me uh, Brian's podcast or Kevin's podcast, and it'll have it saved and it'll play it. Things are moving in that direction. So. Yeah. similar to what I'm doing now with Alexa, I'm playing a 12, 18 month game so that I understand that technology and I understand that product of getting that in front of people so that when everyone else jumps on it, I already have it worked out and I already have all the kinks worked out. The podcast was the same. I was thinking it was about 18 months away from peaking and I still don't think it's peaked and I wanted to get in on it before that happened and mm. that's why I jumped on it. And again, for me, the trigger was for some of my older content, particularly when I was putting out a lot of videos on Instagram and you were limited by the 60 minutes or 60 seconds on Instagram, mm. I was putting out videos and context was getting lost on questions. And I would mm. put out a video on, you know, some diet tip or fitness tip and, you know, the equivalent would be a yoga tip. But in 60 seconds, there's a lot of context that gets lost. And I was getting a lot of crap back from people. And I, I can deal with that. I've dealt with my own fair share of that. But I was like, I have no problem people hating on me or, or disliking me. I have zero problem with that. But I do have a problem with people hating on me or disliking me when the context has been lost on a situation where I'm like, that's not what I meant. And you, only, you didn't understand what I was trying to apply here or what I was trying to talk about here because I got cut off in 60 seconds. I was yeah. having a problem with that because I'm like, I would spend hours in, in the comments and I'd have to write out a text and I'd have to write out a message explaining what my point was. And I'm like, well, that, that got lost in the context of 60 seconds. So I was able to go longer form in podcast. And mm. one of the reasons that it's grown, and I'm very, very fortunate, I understand my circle of competence, which is the areas of the things that I know about. And I stay in those areas. And I love one of the... Max Planck, who was um, Albert Einstein's mentor. So if you're Albert Einstein's mentor, you're a pretty smart dude. He was also a Nobel <laughs> Prize winner. And he used to always say that if you can't legitimately answer the next question, you're outside your circle of competence. And when it came to fitness and nutrition and training, I can always answer the next question. I can always give context to why the keto diet may apply for this person, but why you shouldn't do it as, say, an athlete, you know, because you're working off a different energy system. The same with mm. yoga. If you can't legitimately answer the next question, you're outside your circle of competence. And then you do one of two things. Either you stay in your circle or you expand your circle. You read more. You consume more. You listen to, you know, subscribe to this podcast and listen to it every week. Get more people and more information into your head about your area. And then you expand your circle. That's just a choice in what decision you make. Hmm. And... That was the reason I went into longer form on podcast, and it's probably the reason it's been successful. I also don't filter it in any way. Um, I gave up caring what people think about me a long time ago in the, in the sense of my work or my art or the, the messages I put out. You know, it, it doesn't come back on me. I've got my inner circle of five people whose opinions matter, and outside mm -hmm. of that, I love that I'm able to help and serve the world, and my, my purpose is to make the world better because I was here, but... At the same time, I don't take the hate to heart. I don't take the love to heart because I'm just going to do my thing regardless. And it's allowed me to build a platform on the podcast because your mess serves as your message. And I'm able to be intimate on there. I'm able to talk about my own issues that I'm dealing with. And the reason that I can come at it from different angles is because I've lived it. The reason mm. I can talk about not wanting to press publish on a video because you're scared of people will think is because I lived it. The reason mm. that I'm so big on do your thing and stop letting the outside world and external world or society or your family tell you you can't is because I lived it. So mm. I'm just sharing my experiences and, and how what happens when you come out the other side and you block out that noise. And probably one of the reasons that it's done so well is down to that. It's down to an unfiltering, serving that market and, and knowing who I'm speaking to and being able to contextualize information. I don't talk about things like cryptocurrency 
Like, I, I can't answer the next question. <laughs> like, I, I can't. You know, I can tell you basic information about, you know, Litecoin or Bitcoin or Ethereum, and I can tell you a little bit about the blockchain, but I can't legitimately answer the next question. It's outside my circle, so I don't mm. answer it. And I'm the first to say when I don't know something. Somebody asked me something on Instagram Live, I'm like, I'm not the best person to ask. I have no idea. And mm. I'm not afraid to say that, where one of the things that really annoys me and again, this is probably a mirror of, of a younger self because I used to always think I knew everything and it really annoyed me. I would have hated my 20-year-old self. But <laughs> I, it's, I struggle when, when you don't know something, I'm like, just say you don't know. Like, yeah. It, it, yeah. as opposed to just like dancing around the question, which is something I used to do. And that's probably how it's worked. Again, anyone that wants to start a podcast, and that's why I love you're so proactive with it, that you got on it and you're like, right, I'm going to get a podcast going. And I think it's clever now because it hasn't popped yet. It hasn't peaked as big as it is climbing. It still hasn't hit that social media level. Mm. Kev, wait until you see when your Alexa skill is hooked up to your car and it's linked to your house, how big audio is going to be, how big podcasts are going to be. I think, and again, I don't know, I always give yourself permission to change your mind, but mm. I think right now that's where the puck is going. So it's where I'm playing a little bit in that space on top of what I'm doing. Um, yeah, so I hope that makes sense. That's brilliant. I was just about to ask you, where's the pot going? Is this Alexa thing? Yeah, because I was, I was actually listening to a, a, a George, uh, not George, sorry, um, Jordan B. Peterson. Uh, he was on Joe Rogan this week and he was saying how audio is, is the new text. It, it's, this, it's only going to grow and grow. So this Alexa thing, actually, this is the first time I've heard of this. So I, I'd be interested to, to research this. Just on that, I, I want to go into actually how you do your podcasting. But before I do that, Alexa, you, you mentioned that you'd submitted. What have you been submitting to Alexa? Exactly. So what I what I've just created, we, I literally just sent it off this morning, is mm -hmm. a daily flash briefing. So for me, it's it's the Branky Fitness Daily Fit Tip. So what I've done on Alexa briefing, this will also be available as a podcast, just because I'm aware that I want that message to serve people right now, and I'm mm -hmm. early in the space, but I'm mm -hmm. still working because I want to build that system. So I, I've kind of hedged my bets with that. So it's it's a, a fitness tip in three minutes or less. So basically on Alexa, how Alexa works is you say you have it in your bedroom or your bathroom or your kitchen, you can get flash briefings, a daily flash briefing on Alexa. So you'll come up and go, Alexa, play my daily flash briefing and it'll play all the flash briefings that you're subscribed to. So if you've got my one in your top or your hmm. top five list, it will pay, play my daily fit tip. So yeah. that will be available on podcast as well as a separate entity. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I've submitted today just because that technology... There, it, it's it's AI, it's artificial intelligence, but mm. it's it's still in the minor side of the AI because obviously the way AI is built, it the more you submit to it, the smarter it gets. That's effectively how artificial intelligence works. It's the more you put into it, the, it, it self learns. That's that's how effectively it works. That technology isn't at its, near its peak. It's still in, in its infancy. But yeah. when that starts to take off it's going to be very, very popular. And again, it, potentially it will link directly to podcasts or your store or whatever it is. Like there's going to be a day when you've got your podcast on Alexa, for example, or Google Home or whatever the device is, and you'll be listening to my podcast, your podcast, and I'll mention the fitness mindset. And you'll go, Alexa, pause, order Brian Keane Fitness, the fitness mindset. Alexa, mm. go, the book has been ordered and it will play <laughs> your podcast. That's the technology mm. and where it's going. It's, it's, it's already been designed. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at with that. Very interesting. I, I used to work for an AI company actually and uh, I, it's yeah, it's undoubtable. It's just the way the world is going whether you like it or not. Um, and um, that's really interesting, Alexa. That's okay. That, I've got more research to be done there. You mentioned before we started, I don't know if I can say this, but um I can, I can cut. Um, well, you, you, <laughs> you don't. You I don't, don't filter. I, I don't you, filter yeah, anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you right. know, I heard it's been not to swear. I'm like, I didn't ask beforehand, so I'm just not going to oh, swear. Okay. I don't filter um, any topic or anything. <laughs> if it, as long as you swear passionately, it's okay. Um, but um, no, the, um, what I've so before I ask you uh, talk to you about this, actually, uh, I, I want to um, tell you my the reason behind I asked this question. So firstly, um, when you're self-employed, you don't have a boss. So you don't have someone to tell you, okay, stop doing that. Do this task instead. Okay, is it worth spending that much time on this task? Because it's only going to get you this much return, whatever it may be. So you have the boss. That's what the, the reason why he's the boss or she's the boss is because 
they are good at that time management uh, task uh, um, or delegation. But when you're self-employed and you're a yoga teacher, fitness trainer, you don't know what you're doing and how much, t- you don't know how much time to spend on certain things and what return that will give you. What I'm getting at is with this podcast, uh, I, I've tried to be like, make everything perfect. And, 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 and then you realize you spend ages on something that's not important, like the color of a logo or a graphic or something like that. And yesterday, I did, yesterday I did a podcast here with a, a girl, um, another yoga teacher. And I had, I had the camera set up. I had two cameras and I had like, I was trying to do a video podcast and it was a disaster. It was just, you know, the camera ran out of battery. Then the other camera, the SD card ran out of memory. And I was like, oh, okay. So the whole day, essentially we had a lovely day and we had a nice chit chat. And But the whole day from a business point of view was a complete waste of time. So I wasted a whole day trying to, uh, do unnecessary things that I thought would be flashy and I'd even bring all this down to editing the podcast and planning I, I think that um, unedit, unedited content is vital in my opinion unless you say something that you really it, it is I don't know you something you, you'd massively regret I think that the reason why people love podcasts is because it's not going through a third party. It's not, you know, a news channel that's got a hidden agenda. It's as real as it can get. It's unedited and unfiltered. And um, that's why I, when I listened to your podcast, I was really interested to hear they were so conversational. They didn't seem to be, uh, you weren't, there's no fixed uh, agenda. You know about the person, you know why you're speaking to them, but it's not like a question and answer thing. Um and you mentioned, as I was saying, you mentioned at the start of class that you don't necessarily plan as in like write questions down. So what is your, what is your process to um, actual creating an episode? So depending on whether I'm doing a solo episode or a guest episode, my process is, it's not totally dissimilar. Um, I'll talk you through both just to give you context in case yeah. you expand out to pure solo ones as well. Um, I don't, I do everything in one take. So... My podcasts are a joy to edit. Now, I don't edit my podcast. I outsource. It. We were joking before we came on air <laughs> that like, if we were scaling my tech skills on a one to ten, one turning on a computer, I'm about a one and a half. And <laughs> I, that, I outsource everything. So I'm very, very good at outsourcing weaknesses. And I also outsource. I'm in a position now that I've got more money than time. And I can outsource the things I just don't want to do. I don't yeah. want to edit the podcast. I don't want to put in the intro. I don't want to do the uploads. I just want to record it and put it out there. Mm. Um, so I can do that now. That that comes with time after a certain period of, of quote unquote success or financial success where you're able to do that. Mm. My process for solo episodes is I just basically have the outline of the questions I want to answer and then I free flow it. I don't prepare. I don't pre-plan. I don't mm. do any of that. Largely because... The, of the circle of competence that I talked about, I stay within that circle and I'm able to contextualize. Some of that came off the back of the Stephen King book that I wrote. Again, how you do anything is how you do everything. And he was speaking when he's writing a story. So um, Stephen King, famous horror, horror writer, wrote mm-hmm. The Green Mile, wrote The Dark Tower, wrote countless horror books. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said that he never knew what the end of his stories were going to be until he sat down and wrote and he said the reason that his books were such page turners was because he didn't know what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And that's how I do my podcasts because I don't know what direction they're going to go in. And there's times when I record one and I'll absolutely go off on one. And they don't, they're the ones that land. I, I, did a, I, I recorded one yesterday and one of the questions was about mental health, which is something I've struggled with myself. And mm-hmm. I, I got lit up. I didn't even realize. It was, it was supposed to be question three. In our question four on a five question podcast, I was thought I was just going to talk about certain points, um, my strategies, and I just got lit up. Like literally was was talking about my own issues and just went off on one completely. But I listened to it back and I'm like, wow, that's really good. I I, I was like, I it, that I, I know when I listen and I'm I'm my own biggest critic, mm. and when I can listen back on something or read back on something and go, whoa, that landed, that was good. I know it's going to help people because a lot of it's just talking to my younger self and I just go off. And if I pre-plan what I'm going to say, those moments of quote-unquote inspiration, whatever label you want to put on them, they don't come if I pre-plan them. So I don't. Guess, Mm. I I do a little bit more prep work. 
Um, I'm very, very fortunate with because of my probably my own, my own ability, and again, self awareness is key. I can talk again, as you as you probably noticed. Hmm. I can talk on most things that I'm passionate about or or interested in, hmm. and that gives me a lot of content. So I never have to get a load of people to fill up my podcast so that I have a podcast to go out. If I don't have a guest lined up that I want to talk to, I just don't, I just do a solo episode Mm. and that's what I do. So every guest I have on serves a purpose or I've wanted to have them on for some reason. So I'm genuinely interested in what they have to say. Mm. And that's probably one of the reasons that it comes across so conversational is because I'm asking questions I want to know. Mm. And it just so happens that my audience, and, and I've had people say this, they're like, oh my God, I was dying for you to ask this question and you asked it. And I'm like, because <laughs> well, I was thinking it. The person was speaking and I was thinking it. And I'm like, oh my God. And then I would follow up with the question. So I'd have my prep work done purely because I already knew of the person and wanted to have them on. And I had reached out to them. Um, and I don't need guests. That's the, the beauty of it, which allows me to bring on people that I genuinely want to speak to that I think will either provide value or that I'm genuinely interested in having a conversation with. Hmm. So that's how I do it. Everyone's got their own process and no way is right or wrong. Self-awareness mm-hmm. is key. And I, I'm, I'm not attached to anything that I do. I list, listen to the feedback from people. And people are like, I love how it's conversational or I love how you go off on tangents on your own solo ones. So I do more of what people ask and what people like. I'm Mm. not attached to how I do anything and because it doesn't matter. It's not about me. It's about trying to help and serve and provide as much value as I can. So Mm. being attached to, well, I think it should be this way is ridiculous because it doesn't serve the end goal. It's, it's 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 a silly metric to use for helping people. If you're trying to provide value to them, listen to what your audience has to say and then provide that value. Um, mm. So that's my process. How, how do you, so I was just listening to your, um, you're, you're talking about you speak to people that you want to speak to, which is, uh, you know, brilliant um, strategy. But how, how, for example, do you get people like the happy pair or anyone on your podcast? How do you approach them? What's the medium like Instagram or whatever? And what do you say? Well, I'll ask you, how did you get me on here? <laughs> oh, I see what we did there. Um, I messaged you on Instagram because I'd already met you. Um, and uh, But we'd already um, exchanged a couple of messages because I, I, you know, I thank, thanked you for, for stopping at Wellfest. Um, so yeah, Instagram. Yeah, so, um, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really Instagram. It was the fact that we'd previously connected, which helped. True, yeah, true, um, definitely. Uh, and I liked you because if I, if I didn't like you, I'd be like, no, I'm not doing your podcast. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, and I say no all the time. Like, you know, oh. I'm really, really good at that. I, I do it all the time. I'm like, no, nope. like, sorry. And sometimes I don't even give a reason. Like, but that, that, that comes down to understanding that when you get to a certain point, everybody, this is relative, saying no is probably the best thing you'll learn how to do after learning how to walk because <laughs> otherwise you'll get drowned by things that you don't really want to do mm. and that's that's effectively how we connected and, and i'm the same i'm lucky in the sense that i have i have a platform that because obviously it's, it's one of the main podcasts in ireland 80 90 000 downloads is a lot a, mm. a month and and it does very well i have leverage for even if i've never met somebody yeah. So I can say, look, you know, you've got a book coming out, Leading with Generosity. There's an amazing book by Keith Ferrazzi called Le- Never Eat Alone. And it's a, it's a networking book for business people. And there's a lot of yoga business people listening here. You need to get on and read that book. It's unbelievable, particularly some of the messages. But Lead with Generosity. If I had a euro for every time somebody messaged me out of the blue and was like, can I do this? Will you do this with me? Will you do that? Or, and I'm like, no. Like, that, you haven't provided mm. any value. Like, you can't do that. So mm. you have to get lucky then. Whereas I'll lead with generosity with somebody. I never, like, when I bring somebody on, like, for example, I brought Hazel, the food medic, on. I met her once and I was like, Hazel, your new book is out. I was like, you need to come on the podcast. You have an <laughs> amazing message. I want everybody to read this book or to get your message. Mm. And she was like, yeah, awesome. You've got, like, you know, 80, 90,000 download podcasts, of course. Mm. And it's, I, didn't ask, I wouldn't ask for anything in return. Like I, it's not about me. It's about serving and providing value to the people listening and helping the other person, particularly if I resonate with their message. Mm-hmm. And when you come at it from that angle, and Happy Pair were the same. Like I brought Happy Pair on and they were like, is there anything I can do for you? And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm like, I don't need anything. Thank you so much. And they're amazing people. I freaking love the Happy yeah, Pair. Yeah, me too. But 
they're just amazing. <laughs> but it's the same, and it's leading with generosity. When you do that, it compounds over time. Mm. And I know when people have done it for me, you always end up going the extra mile when it comes back to them. So that's, that would be my advice for getting people on. One, you, you have nothing to lose from asking, f- mm-hmm. first and foremost. There, there, there is an element of that, that if you throw enough crap against the wall, something will stick. Like if you message 100 top yoga people to come on the podcast, you'll probably get two or three that reply because it just mm-hmm. overlaps well with time. Mm-hmm. And, and you can get lucky. I've done, I've done events or podcasts where I'm like, yeah, I'm actually around that time. Or I've randomly met somebody and I just happened to be in that area at that time. You know, like a, a great time to get me is when I'm abroad or abroad somewhere or I'm doing something. Like I met a guy when I went to New York last year with my mom. I, br- I, brought, I bring my mom away every year. And I went to New York with my mom and some guy was like, oh my God, I'm in Queens or wherever he was. He goes, I've been following your stuff for ages. And he'd been commenting on my stuff quite a lot. So I recognized him. That's a really good hack for people is to just be constantly, de- not DMing, but public messaging all the time on because mm. I recognize there's five or six people who comment on all my stuff and if they mm. ever DM like my my DMs get flooded you know like I could there could be fifty to hundred in there over a weekend if I haven't cleared them mm. and they and they just build up as the week goes on particularly if I do a piece of content that resonates with people but I'll if I see you know, certain people pop up that are always commenting. I'll always open their DM because if I can help them, I'm like, well, they comment on all my stuff. They're clearly a fan of what I'm doing or they clearly resonate with what I have to say. Y- you'll, you'll go that extra mile to help them. And I ended mm. up meeting a guy in New York. He was like, where? he goes, I will come down to you. He goes, where are you staying? And I was staying in a hotel in New York. And I was like, cool. I was like, uh, my mom doesn't get up till nine. I was like, I'm going training at whatever it was, half six. I'll have half an hour free from half eight to nine or whatever it was. And he came down. And I just met him for coffee. Like I, I charged 500 euro for a consultation and he just came down mm. and I was like, cool, I'll meet you. I was like, I'm free. So I had recognized and that, that, that can help a lot for bringing people onto a podcast too, just engaging with their stuff and people mm. will recognize you because they're all humans. Everybody's a human. Everybody's a person. And we all react similarly. If we recognize somebody, we're going to come on a podcast with them or we'll help them out in whatever way we can, you know, if it, mm. particularly if it overlaps with schedule. So that would be my advice is it's two approaches. You can throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks or you can build a relationship or put yourself in the situation where you're meeting people that you can bring on as potential guests. That's, that's kind of what I've done. Um, mm. With the exception of one or two people, I, I've known most of them previously or knew them through, you know, one degree of separation through somebody else. Mm. Yeah. And I think what I love about um, that is that you're meeting people. I mean, Joe Rogan said it best. You're a podcast is the only time you can sit with someone or either cross from them or uh, on, on the phone and spend an hour talking about asking them questions that you'd never get to ask them. You know, if I, if I was to ask you these questions, just sit in the coffee shop, it would be a bit weird. <laughs> you'd probably think, yeah. well, why are you inter- interrogating me? Um, but the, 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 I love the way Joe Rogan said it. He said, like, he basically gets people on his podcast that he wants to get on. And uh, he does it for purely selfish reason because he finds him interesting. And you can be, as the podcast listener, you can be the fly on the wall. But he's asking questions that he finds interesting from people that he finds interesting. And um, I think, I think I mean, if you don't, if people listening to this don't know who Joe Rogan is, then, I mean, he has one of the biggest podcasts in the world, maybe the biggest podcast, I'm not sure. Um, so, um, and what, actually, speaking of productivity, obviously Joe Rogan's famous for his productivity, but I've noticed his podcast now, he doesn't even do an intro. There's no intro, there's no outro, there's no <laughs> theme music. It, it, they, the, the conversation starts straight away. So I've been thinking about... Um, cutting out my intro and outro and all the music and stuff um, and keeping it really simple but um, because it's funny like just because you can do something doesn't mean you should like I have the technical skill to because I've learned it through trial and error of adding theme music and you know having it um, fade in and out and all this kind of stuff but is it necessary? I don't know. I mean, I suppose maybe if one day someone wanted to sponsor the podcast, I'd need to have it a bit more professional. But I'm tempted to just have it as you turn it on, you press play, and it's just you're in the middle. You you start you listening at the start of the conversation. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts on that? I think it's really opinion. Um, 
I, I don't think there's that right or wrong way as such. I think Joe Rogan can do whatever he wants. <laughs> I, True. I remember yeah, hearing, I, know. I, I remember, you know, <laughs> I remember hearing his numbers. They're ridiculous. Like, I know, that's um, true. But, but I, I don't think there's a right or wrong way. Like, I listen to some podcasts that are very, very professional, some of the NPR business ones that are really well yeah. edited and everything. And then I listen to some that are just, you know, like this, a conversation back and forth. Mm. I, I don't think there's a, that's what podcasts are great. There, there isn't a right or wrong way. Do you know on YouTube, you, you nearly need to have a professional video, an intro and outro, like I didn't for years just because I didn't know how. And But you kind of do to pop on YouTube, you know, a good thumbnail, etc. Hmm. On, on a podcast, I don't think you need that. I think it just, I think content is king because yeah. people are listening and they're, as you said, fly on the wall in the conversation. I think the content is king. Content is king everywhere. But particularly on something long form like a podcast where you're actually providing value by going into depth or contextualizing why you think this way, I think it doesn't matter. I don't think you need to over edit it. I think it really varies uh, depending on positioning. I think, you know, sometimes an intro and an outro might seem more professional and they can give you a bit of authority in terms of if somebody pops in randomly and, and just sees it on iTunes and there's an intro, you're like, oh, this is legit. So mm. I, th I think it really depends. Um, I don't think it's a right or wrong way. I think it's really just finding what's the best fit for each person. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And as you said, <laughs> it is Joe Rogan. You know, so pe people turn it on, they know Joe Rogan is, but they may turn on mine and go, sorry, who are you? <laughs> so I, maybe I'll stick with the intro uh, for now. Um, and um, yeah, but Joe, I just find, I, I love, I mean, I mean, I love Joe Rogan. He's like, he's like Oprah Winfrey for men, basically, <laughs> if, you yeah. know, if you don't know who he is. Um, so, it, <laughs> so in terms of your, your next... Um, the next big thing for you, you said you have your, your second book coming out. Um, are you going to, and, and as audio is, is well, content king, content is king and audio is, is the king of kings. Are you thinking about maybe doing an audio book? It will be out the, when does it, whenever this goes out, it'll be out in August. Um, I've already recorded it. It's done. Oh. And it'll be on, it'll be on Audible and it'll be on all those platforms. I, I haven't, put it anywhere um, except for the day I was recording in the studio just because they were like it'll take four weeks to get it done um, so I haven't put it anywhere but yeah it will 100% it'll probably be out in the next two weeks or so okay cool so on, on available on audio or uh, audible on, sorry yeah, audible and all of those platforms uh, it'll be on all of them um, it, it's going I, all the other ones I don't use but I use audible <laughs> yeah I love audible it's amazing um, well, that's exciting so anything else in, in uh, next few in terms of where the puck is going any other insights um, you give us? <laughs> a, a lot of it is, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk, who's an online marketer. He kind of speaks on the cloud and the dirt, that the clouds are where the puck is going, the Alexa skills, where things mm. are going to be in 18 months. And, and I do keep 10, 15, 20% of my band within that space, mm. just so that I'm ready when it comes. But I spend 80% of my time focusing on the process and focusing on what I do day to day because I know that that's where the success is. Like, I'm a big fan, and one of my quotes that I live by is the Buddha quote that if you can't be happy at a destination, how, or you can't be happy on the journey, how are you going to be happy at a destination? Mm -hmm. And that's where my life is right now. It's the process of the things that I get to do every day that I freaking love. I'm so, I, I'm so grateful that I get to do what I do and have the life that I have, and I get to do it every single day, and there's small portions of the day where I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't have to do that. But they're so few and far between. Um, mm. And I, I'm so grateful that I get to do that now. In terms of what I'm doing, it's building up the podcast, um, working on obviously the researching and get writing on the process for the new book. A lot of different things along those lines. But I just do it every day and show up and do it every day. I, I've got, I break my life into four quad, quadrants, Kev. So I've got mm -hmm. health, wealth, love, and fulfillment. And I score those quadrants, you know, one out of 10 every couple of weeks or every month. So health, my mental health, my physical health, events I'm doing, my wealth, my bank account, never having to really worry about money anymore, my love, my relationships romantically, familial, my daughter, my mom, my inner circle of people, and then my fulfillment, which is, is this the thing I get to do every day I break it into those four quadrants and as long as I'm moving the needle forward in those four quadrants I'm happy and even though I play in those clouds and I have 10 to 20 percent of my bandwidth there hmm. it's what I'm doing every day to move everything else on those needles forward 
Um, so again, without giving you a short answer on it, it's focusing on the things every day. Like I'm a big fan of the Will Smith story. I had um, I had a guy on the podcast recently. Uh, mm. might may not actually be out by the time this airs. Uh, James Swanwick is his name. He he used to be an ESPN anchor, but he was a celebrity interviewer. He did the interview with Will Smith, where Will Smith was talking about how his dad, the the, the celebrity A list star Will Smith, Fresh Prince of Bel Air Will mm-hmm. Smith, for those not familiar. Um, <laughs> I think everybody knows who Will Smith is, yeah. though, if you're anyway into movies. And he was talking about the story about when his dad knocked a wall. And he made himself and his brother rebuild it when he was about 12 years old. And he goes, his dad told him that when you're rebuilding a wall, you don't set out to build the biggest, baddest wall. He goes, you set out and lay each brick as perfectly as a brick can be laid. And you do that consistently and then you have a wall. That's Mm. kind of the way I see my life. I'm not focusing on building the biggest, baddest wall. I'm focusing on laying each brick as perfectly as I can day by day, knowing that it's going to build a wall in the future. That's kind of how I spend my day thinking. And so, again, as I said, to not give you a short answer on it, that's what I'm doing, (laughs) more or less. Yeah, well, um, Brian, I mean, you're you're a pioneer and your your enthusiasm is um, inspiring, man. uh, It really is. It's, um, yeah, I can't thank you enough for for taking the time to speak with me. So, um, for the for the people listening, check out Brian's book, The Fitness Mindset. Check out the podcast, Brian King Fitness. And uh, what's the new book called? Can you say? Uh, well, it hasn't. Well, I'm it's just researching yet, it now. No, it's, I'm only researching it now. I haven't even put pen to paper. Uh, working title. Yeah, yeah, no. Work, work, working title right now is going to be the life mindset. Um, so a follow up to the mindset section of the fitness mindset. So that is not. Um, we're talking this time next year um, okay. before release. So I'll mm. from September first, I'm putting pen to paper, um, and I will literally be going into a, a cave for several months while yeah. I write the first draft. Um, so yeah, looking forward for that one as well. Yeah, man, that's class. Okay, so I'll definitely check out Audible in a couple of weeks and uh, look at the. So the fitness mindset is going to be out on Audible in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Be brilliant. Pr- probably before August. Nice one. Okay, cool, man. So, yeah, thanks again. (laughs) Mate, this was awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you learned as much as I did and you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, you can leave me a review on uh, iTunes with uh, five stars, please. And uh, I hope to speak to you again next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.